Yesterday, someone asked about um, free will and um, what's the opposite of free will? Predestined. Um, In all my life, I have to say, you know, I have been, uh, well, of course, never thoroughly, but, um, but that, that is with the Buddha, Buddhist text also. But um, I have to say, to really solve this problem of free will, predestined, Fate, 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 you know, fatalism, luck. There is no philosophy or a theory I have so far found that is better than, um, well, generally Buddhism and especially, you know, like Abhidharma. I've even actually listened to a lot of um, discussions in the podcast and, uh, you know, like, panel discussions regarding this. And I think it's very, very related to the aspiration. So I'm going to dwell on this a little bit. Because when we talk about aspiration, as I said yesterday, we, you know, of course, you are always talking about something to do with the future, isn't it? May I be this, may they be this and that. And actually, <clears throat> we stopped um, talking about uh, bird's eyes view, and remember we stopped at the point where we were aspiring to remember the lives, basically, actually, draw up into Jeva temperature, you know, like, not only remembering the past lives, but just seeing the whole life, even the future ones, kind of um, quite, what do you call it? You have to sort of make some prep, you know, you have to get used to the logic a little bit with this one. Um, <clears throat> And it's a, I want to dwell on this a little bit because uh, the main ingredient of the Pranidhana Raja prayer is, of course, bodhicitta. It, the name of, the <clears throat> name of this uh, aspiration, is, uh, part of the name is Arya, Arya Pranidhana Raja, Arya. Arya means a sublime sort of, like, Yes, sublime, something that is not ordinary. This name usually is given to like Arya Tara, Arya Manjushiri, <clears throat> someone who's, who has transcended, transcended all the mundane. But the text is also called Arya. So there is a reason for that, and that reason is because um, it contains the bodhicitta, so it is entitled to have the name Arya. Uh, it is because of that, you know, also towards the end, uh, the, the prayer itself, you know, like, it, uh, it's because of that, even if you don't read it, if you just keep that text, text on the shrine it's like, and revere this, you, you have so much merit. Okay, uh, going back to the question, you know, free will and predestined and all that. Um, you see, I think, I'm going to just explain this a little bit, because whenever Buddhists talk about a karma, they seem to always fall into two traps. Sometimes they say, oh, it's my karma, what to do? See, fatalist, predestined. Other times they say, oh, you should create good karma so that you will become this and that. So, free will. So now the question is, what is, okay, which is, which is the right one? Both are actually wrong. 
And this is important that you know this. Um, and this is very related to bodhicitta, so I need to really carefully construct this one. And also I should say, this is what makes so Buddhism so unique. But not that easy to understand this. I have got into trouble by teasing a monk in Thailand. Because in, in the Theravada tradition, they teach things like, <clears throat> you know, they teach an, anatta, I mean, anicca dukkha anatta. Anatta means selfless. And selfless is the, I mean, this is the cream of the cream. If, if the teaching of the selflessness is not taught, the anicca and dukkha, that, that's a very pessimist and very doomsday teaching. You understand, everything is impermanent, nothing gives you satisfaction. Who would like to hear that? So anatta is like, really, the most important, even in the Sharvakayana level. So there was this monk, you know, I love always offer these arms. You know, monks go, in the Theravada countries, they go begging. And that's the most, I don't know, for me, it's like the most inspiring, one of the most inspiring sight. So about 25 years ago, actually, an American ambassador uh, was a, some, you know, I think he was a Buddhist Come for on. Thailand. Uh, because I went to the embassy to get my visa. And there's a long line, so I get up so early to line up. And usually the monks go begging, um, you know, early in the morning. Like Jeez. really early, like six, like sunrise. And I was already there, and there was already a few people lined up. The embassy only opened something like nine. And then suddenly there was some commotion. And then I see from one side, there's about... 20 monks with a begging ball, just very silently, you know, that's what they do, silently, bare feet walking towards the embassy. And suddenly the embassy gate opens with this incredible looking American Navy guard just opening the door, and the ambassador comes with all the offerings. Anyway, this is just a sidetrack. So anyway, I, you know, I do this, you know, this is such a beautiful sight. But, you know, as always, I'm always trying to, I don't know, tease people or stir people. <laughs> and in, in Thailand and Burma, Sri Lanka, you would n notice the, the lay people, farmers, the, you know, vendor sellers. And I mean, the, there's even a dedicated shop, a monk's arm shop, where you can actually buy packages, full full offering, half offering, you know, just a symbolic offering, you, you can. And very ordinary poor people also, they offer a little bit of rice. And the monks will, you know, chant this very, very um, important sort of uh, script, uh, you know, the part of the, you know, Buddhist uh, script. Um, anyway, um, Usually the monks don't talk. But one day, this monk and I offered whatever, I had a few fruits, and he knew sort of uh, I was not native, so he spoke in English. So that, you know, repeated next day, and, you know, sort of he, he began to know that I'm there. And then, you know, this act is considered very meritorious, so people do this diligently. So... I asked him, you know, he doesn't know I'm a Buddhist. No, I sort of pretended I'm... <laughs> so, he, so I asked him, well, you know, if, they, if, if the anatta is truth, that there is no self, that means you, you are, your self is not there, my self is not there, so who is, who is accumulating the merit? What is merit? Who is gaining the merit? Yeah, well, that is sort of the end of our friendship. <laughs> anyway, um, so... I want to, yeah, this is a kind of, kind of important, so I know some of you are quite jaded with this example, I'd say, I have been telling, but for the sake of the new people, you need to bear this. Now, if you are having a nightmare of falling from a cliff, there is the whole act of the beginning of the fall and the duration, you know, the middle of the fall, and perhaps, you know, 
breaking your hips or whatever. And you'll be scared, you'll be panicked, all of that. And those cannot be denied. And this period of falling till you are, okay, landed on the ground, in this period, you can talk about karma. Bad karma, good karma, just generally karma. In reality, though, you are just sleeping in, in your bed. You, you are not falling. So there is no beginning of the falling, the middle of the falling, and the end of the falling, too. So can you see the not falling in the reality of not falling and the illusion of falling can be together? So this is why to us a Buddhist, regarding whether, whether everything is a free will or, you know, if you believe in free will, then you are actually basically saying the fall in the dream is not a dream, it's a real, real falling. Or if you believe in predestined, same thing. Yeah, so this is a little difficult, I think it will take some time to get used to this logic. Anyway, short answer for this is, Buddhist karma is neither free will nor predestined. Sometimes it appears to have free will, other times it appears to be already fixed. Okay, I want to further go deeper into this now. Uh, <clears throat> okay, now this approach is perhaps very Indian, although other, I mean, even the Western philosophy, even science, Perhaps they, even though they may no, not package it this way, actually, it, I think it falls into this, this sort of category of, um, uh, I don't know, um, construction. Okay. Um, now, you, we, of course, we need to know that like science is, they, they've never really come to conclusion, which is one of the, the great thing about science. Okay, so keep that in your head. You know, so that's quite good. They, they say, you know, we are experimenting still. So far, it's like this. So far, Panadol seems to work, but who knows, maybe it's going to harm us. You know, like that. It's always we are under experiment. Statement like this, people like Nagarjuna, Chandakirti, the great philosophers in Buddhism, they like this. No argument with that one. Now, but then, habitually, habitually, okay, first let me, uh, let me present this one. The Indian, the unique Indian way of constructing a theory. I'm sorry, these are a little bit tec too technical for the new ones, but you sort of have to bear with this because we are, after all, you know, discussing quite an important text, and uh, I don't want to sort of wash it down and to something very, very simple, you know, may all be happy, may all be not, you know, free from unhappiness. It's, it's much more than that. So remember earlier I talked about this dream analogy? And this analogy demonstrates the Indian way of constructing a theory. As I give you the example, I'm talking about two things, ultimate and relative. Ultimately, you are not falling. But relatively, you are falling. Now, this ultimate and relative, they are also not like one is in the east and one is in the west. Um, they are kind of, yeah, they are one. But also you can't really say they are one because you are actually not falling, but you appear to be falling also, right? So for instance, if a scientist say about Big Bang, let's say, let's just talk about this Big Bang because perhaps it's easier for the, you know, new people to relate. If the scientists say Big Bang exists, I mean, yeah. If a scientist present Big Bang theory on the relative level, no problem at all with the Buddhists, no problem. That, yeah, but if a scientist sort of develop the theory of Big Bang, ultimate level, 
then the Buddhists will think that Big Bang and the Almighty God has no difference. They're all wrong. Yeah, this is, it, it, it will, you will get used to the, you have to get used to this way of thinking, I guess. Again, I know nothing about Taoist teachings, but as I read some of the stanzas from the beginning, you can feel that they also think very similar. You know, like, name that can be given is not a name. You know, you are almost talking like the ultimate. But then comes all these names. So, you know, like, a relative. So now your question, okay, let's go back to the bird's eyes view. So what is this bird's eyes view? What we are praying is, when we fall, remember? We dream, we have a nightmare, we are falling now. We are aspiring that at the least, okay, at the least, we are aspiring, may we know that we are dreaming. Because when you know that, then the beginning of the fall, the middle of the fall, all of this you see it with the bird's eyes view. What does that do? Oh, it does a lot of things, because if you know, really, that you are dreaming, you might just, oh well, let's just pause for a moment, and let's just, I don't know, let's just explore the, you know, if you are, you know, falling from a building, you might want to just take this advantage of looking at the, through the windows <laughs> of <laughs> other people, because, you know, you are not going to break any limbs, so see, this combination of this, what we call understanding the non-duality, is like the key of the aspiration, which in other words, the bodhicitta. And in order to remember this, uh, we have aspiration to always have revulsion towards the worldly life. Okay, what is a revulsion towards worldly life? Of course, you know, very, very, in a very general level, you know, like getting addiction towards social media, I don't know, carpets, tables, stuff like that. But, most important level of revulsion, you, okay, you are falling now again, going back to the <laughs> dream. As you fall, okay, you are falling from the building, from the 26th floor, and by the 20th floor, where your friend is staying, and um, you pass your friend who's just smoking on the balcony. Um, if you scream, hey, I'm falling! Yeah, that's you are falling. <laughs> that's, that's, that's like, you know, not being able to, what do you call it, uh, have the revulsion towards mundane life because you are really screaming, help! That's easy to understand. But if your friend says, hey, what are you doing? Um, if you say, well, nothing actually, I'm not really falling, you should try. That also, <laughs> that also is a falling to the, uh, the revulsion because you are denying either relative truth or ultimate truth. This is such a big thing for Buddhists, not to be extreme. If you become, yeah, this is, they, they use the word like, you become nihilist or you become eternalist. Yeah, so here in this, in this sentence, may I, may I always have this renunciation mind Yes, carpets, gold ring, whatever, of course, the renunciation. But may I also have a renunciation, revulsion towards all values, liberal values, fascist values, I don't know, uh, just all values. That's a difficult, much more difficult than carpet, I'm telling you. Because your value is your character, and you know, character is so important. Like, yeah. You know, identity, these are, you know, values. So may I always, may I always be able to renounce all my identity, values. That's what. 
and maybe may I always be able to keep my um, ethics. Wow, that's a big subject. And I'm also wondering whether the ethic, the English word ethic is actually doing the justice, um, translating the word shila or the tsutim, we call it tsutim. The Tibetan word tsul is something to do with the way, the, yeah, the truth. Water is wet, that is the truth. That is the way of the water. Outside is cold. If I pour this over me during the break, it's not really a good idea if I'm going out, or even now. It's not a good idea. That's it. That is the core meaning of the Buddhist ethic. Anything that you go against the truth, that will only bring you misery, problems, disappointment. Of course, you know, may I always be, you know, May I always be diligent in, you know, not killing, not lying, not slandering, not, you know, all of that. Of course, you know, that's on the relative level. It's, you know, you need, you know, that's, but, um, like, just ethic, like, especially in the Mahayana, um, ethic is, comes in sort of three categories. Not harming others, like killing, stealing, helping others, ethic, um, ethic of helping others. Mm, I don't know, food, medicine, shelter, information. Now the third one, this is a very, very unique for the bodhisattvas. I mean, generally Buddhists, but especially bodhisattvas. Ethic of helping others. I mean, um, not harming. Give a chudichudim. Wait. Um, uh, not harming others. Nijud uh, dambitsudim. Nijud dambitsudim. Yeah. Uh, not not engaging into non-virtue. Yeah. Sorry, I take back already. Uh, not engaging into non-virtue action. Yeah. That's one of the ethic. Like not killing, not stealing. The second is engaging into virtuous actions such as giving medicine, whatever. The third ethic is helping others. Now this is complicated. But if by you killing somebody, if it helps a lot of people, what do you do then? You see? So there's a lot of that, that category. Big study on that one. Or by you lying to some, somebody or something, and you are saving lots of beings and planets, what then? What should Bodhisattva choose? But of course, there's also the danger of you interpreting yourself that this will help. But that could be just your interpretation. So, anyway, uh, may I always be May I always manage to maintain my ethic? Oh, by the way, these are all the aspiration so that you can, you will keep your bodhicitta intact. What does that mean? Going back to our example, so that your understanding and experience of falling and not falling together, this knowing this is intact. And okay, the next one is in order to in order to enhance this bodhicitta, keep this bodhicitta, may I always may I utter the <clears throat> teachings of the Buddha in different language. Yeah, that's a that's a big one for the bodhisattvas. Not just to human beings, to the gods, to the insects, have the aspiration to teach to just every, every beings in different language. Among many other, of course, you know, I mean, of course, it's, you, will, you understand. 
Uh, it's a virtuous action. It's a virtuous deed to share dharma to ordinary people. Of course you understand that. But I think it's much more than that. When you try to explain this, the whole, you know, the bodhicitta, for instance, Mahayana teachings, not only when we say different language, we are not only talking as the language as in, you know, Chinese, English, but just different, you know, way of communicating. Because for each being have a different, different values, different thinking. How would you teach this ancient Mexican Mayans who, you know, they have this game, they, they play this game and the winner gets the honor of uh, having his head being chopped. How do you talk to them? You need a different language. Mm. Communication is difficult, right? Okay, <clears throat> then also, yeah, also when we talk about um, the aspiration to utter the uh, aspiration to teach in to different beings with a different language. Um, we are <clears throat> aspiring to share the information of six parameters. And for the person who is doing the aspiration, it helps to strengthen uh, this, uh, strengthen this um, ability to remember the bodhicitta, or the teachings. Okay. Next, <clears throat> aspiring to hmm, purify all the non-virtuous actions, non-virtuous deeds and its impact. Uh, this is a, a, okay. Again, very big uh, subject: virtue and non-virtue. What? what makes something non-virtuous. I think the easiest way for you to understand is anything that takes you further from the truth, such as anatta. So, for instance, like harming others. Usually we harm others because we have self-cherishing or clinging to oneself. And clinging to the self definitely is one of the key, actually the key cause to distract you from the truth. Um, and then also having aspiration to uh, purify obscurations. Okay, this is again a very big um, subject when we talk about obscurations. Usually the obscurations are sort of the impact or the result of the negative uh, deeds, actions. But um, they can also in turn become the cause of the negative uh, actions. Um, so many different um, obscurations, uh, but uh, let's discuss just three, for instance, uh, wrong view, pride, and doubt. Um, <clears throat> this three sort of stands out among many other, um, many, many, obscurations, these three, sometimes even jealousy. It, you know, these, uh, these are some of the most difficult to challenge. Um, okay, pride. Pride is actually 
opposite of confidence in this case we are talking about. Um, and also, when we talk about pride, you are always um, re referring to someone else. Uh, I mean, you are always comparing with someone else. Uh, confidence is not necessarily referring to someone. Like, uh, I am a human, but um, I'm much better than so-and-so. That's more like a pride. It, this is very, you know, very general level. I think, yeah, I think when we talk about pride, that's what we are talking. But from Mahayana's point of view, um, there's a much more subtle pride. Even <clears throat> for the time being, it's necessary, but you also need to know, even you aspiring for enlightenment can be a pride. But some of this pride, we need it as a fertilizer. Mm. Just all duality is a pride. So and, and we are talking on a very, very high level. Um, <clears throat> basically, you can also say pride is the big ingredient, big part of the pride is also insecurity. Also, something to do with um, you haven't made up your mind, that element is there. You haven't come to a conclusion, but you are pretending that you have come to a conclusion. That is what pride is, usually. Um, yeah, insecurity, basically. So, okay, so that's pride. And it is too many information, but for, for now, pride. And then, doubt. This is a really, this is a challenging, Obscuration, because it's also a it can be a necessary tool. Even the you know Buddha himself said, you know, you should analyze my teachings. You should not take things for granted, so on and so forth. So doubt can be a big part of the path. It is it is kind of helpful, but if you give in too much to the doubt, and if you put put too much emphasis on doubt like critical thinking, you know, like critical thinking. This is something that we modern people cherish. Then it does not again lead you anywhere. And it gets worse by combining with the pride. So a lot of so-called critical thinking, analytical thinking, critical thinking, I don't know, a lot, lot of people who think that that's who they are, they usually have a pride, meaning they already have a conclusion. I mean, they pretend. I don't know. Um, well, they think they have a con they, they are very sure that they have a conclusion. So basically what I'm saying is it never becomes a proper critical thinking because you already have decided. You are only trying to find a fault, so to speak. Yeah, this is an, one obscuration because this kind of thinking will never... You know, anyway, oh yeah, I should, I forgot to tell you. What really stops you from going out of the box? These three. Let's say you are an artist. You want to go out of the box. What stops you? Pride, doubt, and wrong view. Because of your pride, you will always, always want to be... I don't know, accepted also. It's complicated. Now, these three are very complicated emotion or uh, obscure. That's why it's called obscuration. Dip, dipa, 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 non virtue, or uh, akushala, non virtue, sin, I guess, for the. And um, dipa is obscuration. 
because it's too, it's, it, it makes things unnecessarily so complicated. Okay, the worst one is the Lokta, wrong view. That's, you know, doubt, pride, it still does not, it, it's a bit like, uh, what do you call it? This is the classic example. It's a bit like um, um, strong wind. Let's say if you are planting a flower, like a typhoon or big wind, may unsettle the growth of the flower. But the wrong view, that is like burning the seed of the flower, no That's more flower. Now, the wrong view, this is big. Uh, and this, you, we may think, oh, that, you know, it shouldn't really happen to me, but it's not true. It happens so easily. I mean, for now, we can only, you know, for the Buddhists, you know, practitioners, followers, you, we can, I guess, we can sort of suffice by thinking, oh, you know, I believe in karma, I believe in cause and condition and effect, I don't really believe that some, you know, there's somebody who creates everything. You know, that, that much kind of a right view we have. But not being able to really accept the whole shunyata, it proves that there is lots and lots of wrong view in us. Yeah, and this, this really happens a lot. And it, yeah, it's a difficult one. Anyway, you know, <clears throat> um, for the Mahayana, the answer is not being, having, uh, having, conviction towards a dualistic view. That's a wrong, wrong view. And I underline the word conviction. When I say conviction, you know, we all have dualistic habit, of course, but not necessarily wrong view. It's just your habit. But through study, through analysis, through hearing and contemplation, and you still think something is permanent, something truly exists, then seed is burnt, falling into extreme, we call it. Aspiration to be free from um, karma, emotion, and um, du kind of mara, demon, I guess you can call it. Of course, we are not talking about some externally existing demon, uh, I think this is going to elaborate later, so I'm going to um, continue with the stanza. Anyway, the aspiration is divided into two. These aspirations are mainly for the bodhisattva of the beginning level. Okay, then aspiring to perfect what we call Buddha field. Uh, <clears throat> Perfecting the Buddha field is um, very, um, it, it, this is something you will find in the Mahayana Sutras. Um, basically, having aspiration that you will have your own Buddha field where other sentient beings can have aspirations to go or to be reborn. Um, those who um, you know at like the Chinese you will know uh, the whole um, whole phenomena about pure land um, in fact like in Japan and China I think and Korea also um, they even it even became a, almost like a tradition, a school. They even call it pure land, pure land school. Uh, so, uh, 
I went to <clears throat> the, the head of the Pure Land School, um, the monastery in China, a few years ago. Um, as I enter, the, you know, they were giving us pamphlets because, you know, for the, all the tourists, you get the pamphlets that has the explanation. It says, Amitabha, Amitabha, something Amitabha, and anyway, Buddhist heaven. I guess, you remember earlier we talked about how you have to learn to communicate to different beings with a different language. I guess, even though the word heaven sort of annoyed me, I thought, yeah, why not? But um, <clears throat> then as I went in, the temple itself is one of the most beautiful temple. It's so beautiful. And then all these Chinese characters, they have these characters written, the ancient sort of calligraphy. And I have a, quite a good translator with me. So I have made him translate quite a lot of them you know, like right on the spot. And I was thinking like, if only they just translate some of these and put it on the brochure. But I understand because some of the, some of the you know, contents of the pure land is maybe not that easy to digest for people. Anyway, since it, yeah, this is kind of, uh, remember, it, it is mentioned again and again several times that those who ever does this, they will enter into the land of the Amitabha. Migrating is a such a thing for sentient beings. You can just see it if you go walk around in Robson Street. Um, this is one of the human beings sort of, Buddhists call it klesha, it's like an emotion, right? Grass is always greener on the other side. It, it just exists from the, you know, from the dualism started. Going somewhere, a better place, like the wild west, land of dream, whatever, you know, like... You know, and, but of course, for different people, there are different, you know, different... Uh, different, uh, what is it? land. For good Jeff, he had a different land. For um, I've said this actually to some people and I want to mention this here. This is how the Mahayana's pure land works. I will give you an example. Usually when you go somewhere there's always an aim, I don't know, for a job interview or to pick up some package or to see a museum or something like this, or to meet your uh, uncle, I don't know, like always, or to actually settle there. Uh, okay, I'm talking kind of a very profound level, so be prepared. Um, and I'm just giving you some sort of a, the atmosphere of the, when, when here, when they talk about pure realm, sort of the ingredient, one of the ingredients, atmosphere. After this session, if you just walk on whatever the road and just go, doesn't matter where you reach, you have nothing to do. Immune. Nothing to, there is no place to reach. If you have to have an uh, object, an uh, aim, maybe how about North Vancouver, just to blow your nose. Upon reaching there, blow nose and come back. I bet you this will be the most blissful trip. Because, you know, blowing nose is not that a big deal, right? Upon reaching there, you can really blow it ceremoniously if you want. And actually, if you really want to do it kind of, you know, with a proper ritual, maybe not today, but tomorrow, let's say, 
get up tomorrow in the morning and put on your best dress as if you are going for a, the, the most important job interview on your napkins. This is for the, in preparation for the, <laughs> you know, blowing nose. Make really big fuss about this, you know, ironing. Yeah, then just, I don't know, go take taxi or walk, or take boat. And of course, for the benefit of all sentient beings, of course. <laughs> and you reach there, North Vancouver, place where you will forever depart from your snot. <laughs> I'm giving you, this is actually really, even though I'm trying to make it a little like this, watered down, but this is actually the very important aspect of the pure realm. But because, but I understand, because many people, when they read the pure realm description, they get, attract, they get distracted by this birds that speaks, swimming pool, or... Oh, the very important pure realm description. You know, like, if the ground is supposedly, like, if you press, it goes, it sinks, and if you let go, it comes up, like a sofa seat. You know, many of these um, prayers were written several hundred years ago when only very, very, very small amount of people can uh, afford sofa seat. And just imagine if all the birds start to talk, I don't think you will have a much of a good day. But please, you know, read the Amitabha, pure, um, pure, pure lands, you know, sutras, it's just so beautiful. But, but you have to think this context is so beautiful, actually. There's even a mention, if you do doubt about a pure realm, there's a degree of doubt, right? Little doubt about the pure realm. You may reborn in the Amitabha realm, in the lotus. Usually they are always reborn in the lotus, but the lotus will not blossom right away. Yeah, these descriptions are just so profound. It's just, you know, you need to communicate with the ordinary people. So that's how they communicate. And... Um, So anyway, there's um, that aspiration. May I, may I perfect, may I perfect the Buddha realm. Yeah? So when I say may I perfect the Buddha realm, just think about the blowing nose, then probably it will make a little sense. Of course, you can still think about talking birds, swimming pool, all of that. Yeah, whatever, beautiful things, you know, trees, the mountains, the lake, and the turquoise, all of that. Okay, then... Now, may I always wear the armor? May I, may I always wear armor? The armor of entering into the Mahayana path. Um, armor of never giving up. Accum uh, accumulation of merit and accumulation of wisdom. Armor of never stopping to uh, liberate sentient beings. Okay, so anyway, the word armor is sort of symbolic, but really uh, talking about uh, not feeling exhausted or losing inspiration, not to become lethargic, not to become uh, discouraged. Uh, the reason why we get discouraged is because we are not, um, not uh, well-versed or we are not, um, uh, you know, um, we, we don't have enough understanding of wisdom and method, for instance. Uh, okay, so there's many examples given, for instance, when a bodhisattva got so exhausted and discouraged because it's taking so long. Uh, Buddha giving encouragement by saying that the time is a totally an illusion, that a bodhisattva must 
benefit sentient beings just like how a mother um, who has a, a, one child uh, dreams that the child is drowning in a river. Mother will not think twice but immediately jump in the river to save. But with a bodhisattva, one who is adorned with the wisdom, will also know that this is just a dream. Yeah. So these are the sort of um, few of the reasons uh, talking about armor that a bodhisattva must wear. Uh, maybe we can uh, now you can ask some questions. I, I believe there's many questions, online questions or something like that. And then uh, later I will continue this afternoon. So we start with an online question? Yes, uh, please. Do you want to have um, in-house as well or just online? Online. Uh, the first question is, what is the last thought we should aspire to at the moment we die as a Mahayana Buddhist? Uh, there's many, but I think one of them is actually what we just spoke, entering into the Buddha field. That could mean really thinking about the Amitabha Buddha and Amitabha Buddha realm and have the aspiration to be reborn there at all costs for the benefit of all sentient beings. On the more profound level, realizing that the Amitabha Buddha realm is not somewhere out there, but it, here, this moment, this very place. Yeah, do you want to ask the question? Sure, yeah. So the question is, um, in different Buddhist sutras, there are practices about aspiring to enter the pure, pure land, but in, in the sutras, it also says that we should abolish all dualism. So how should we treat whether there is pure land or not, and how should we look at it? Yeah, as I said, the dream, during the dream, remember, there's the beginning, you know, and all of that, yet it's not there, it's there. So this, this juggle, this understanding of this relative truth and ultimate truth, if you can accept that, then all this works. Otherwise, yes, it sounds like there's a just continuous contradiction all the time. As I asked to that monk, Anatta, why do we be, why do we offer arms? Okay, we have a question from a philosopher in Germany. Uh, the pride, doubts, and wrong views you criticize seem to be similar to dualism, criticism, and conception which are, however, fundamental aspects of philosophical work. Does that mean I have to give up philosophy in order to be a true Buddhist? Yes. <laughs> but, uh, but, but you should, you will also have to give up being Buddhist later, so it doesn't really matter. Okay, again, one Mama. more. Uh, Rinpoche spoke yesterday about renunciation. How to practice renunciation without falling into nihilism? Okay, I will go back to my example of dream. Here, you need to know the real renunciation is really knowing that when you fall, you are actually not falling. That's why I, was, I said, when you fall, if you scream, you are falling into scream dream and think, not knowing that this is a dream, that is nihilism. Yes. When you make an aspiration, are you in essence aspiring to change or to accept? I think both. Accepting the true Buddha, uh, your Buddha nature and changing, the, changing in, uh, in the context of, un, you know, like undoing the cocoon that is wrapping your Buddha nature. Rinpoche, thank you for your beautiful teachings. From my perception, my karmic perception, when I hear you, for me it's always 
like in one sentence, yes and no, and in the same time, it's a not contradictory. And my question is about renunciation and uh, discipline. You said renunciation is mean renouncing all the views, but discipline, there is a view, there is a morality. So how in the same time actually renounce all the view and follow the morality? I'm glad that you guys are asking this. This is just as how I tease that monk. This is what you need to get used to with the Mahayana concept of relative truth and ultimate truth. I think what you need to know is this. Until you know you are dreaming, you will always be panicked. It doesn't matter. You are, you are peacefully sleeping on your bed, but you will still be in panic. As long as you have panic, path is valid. As long as you are dreaming, somebody sort of, you know, waking you up is valid. In reality, uh, somebody waking you up is not helping you at all in getting rid of this real problem, because there was never a real problem. Okay? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your teaching, Rinpoche. Um, you mentioned being an artist, and I was thinking, uh, uh, um, as an artist, when you go to your work, you would want to bring right view. Um, and I was thinking about the Buddhist idea that you have the highest view, high as the sky, but fine as um, sampa flower, um, you know, your actions. But if, hypothetically, Allen Ginsberg, if he were still alive today, were to ask you, when I go to my writing desk, what should I do when I sit down, other than write view? Um, would there be, when I start to write during writing and, and when I end my writing session? Thank you. Okay. Again, very connected to, um, so relative bodhicitta, you know, remember I think we talked yesterday, it doesn't matter what you do, whatever you do, even mundane things like waking up in the morning, may it somehow lead me to awaken myself and others. I think that is the fundamental and the easiest I think right now, because I'm just giving you a sort of a summary of this, this chapter, which really has everything there, so maybe it's uh, confusing you people a little bit. Um, this is, yeah, this is very big. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a very profound level. Mm. Yes, in one sense it talks about no time. If no time, how does the aspiration work? As I said right at the beginning today, aspiration always has something to do with in the future. Yeah, but time and again in these stanzas, this is dealt with. For instance, it says, you should prostrate to the Buddhas of the future, now. How do you do that? I'm here and there, you know, about to come in the future. How do I do that? These are Mahayana's incredible method of trying to really, basically, trying to stir our normal way of thinking. Okay? Yeah? Hello, Rinpoche. Um, for the past few years, one thought that's become really prominent in my mind is that free will is an illusion. And whenever I start thinking in terms of absolute reality, my mind seems to naturally gravitate towards nihilism. And I've been cautioned, uh, or in the teachings I've heard many cautions against nihilism. But my, from my perspective, nihilism is not untrue. And if it's not untrue, um, can it be used as a valid tool in my spiritual process? Actually, nihilism as a habit, we all have. That's why we get depressed, for instance. Also, we are also, by habit, eternalist. That's why we also get ridiculously hopeful. You know, so that's always there. What you don't want is a nihilism as a result of, mm, but, okay, classic Mahayana language, languages, a result of a analysis. 
Because if you, you know, okay, so you analyze, is it, you know, like through your logic, through, I don't know, scientific tool, and then come to a conclusion, nothing exists. That is dangerous. Yeah, again, going back to the dream example, when you fall, you will be afraid, even though in reality you are not falling. We <laughs> always go back to that. Um, now the thing is this, the interesting thing is, if you analyze, let's say, then if your analysis is good, then you may say, oh, I'm just dreaming. You just, you know, that's good. But let's say, um, by analyzing, and you come to a conclusion that I'm trying to remember the Nagarjuna, I mean uh, Chandragiti's words, but um, <clears throat> that that okay, so. If you say that you have never dreamt, you never had that nightmare, then that's a nihilism. No, you, you, you are sweating, you are screamed, you are like shouting, you know. Okay, yeah. Okay, Rinpoche mentioned that jealousy is also a great obstacle for practitioners. I feel like jealousy is subtle. <clears throat> Sorry, and difficult to overcome. Rinpoche, what is the best way to overcome jealousy? A very easy, you know, I mean, easy sort of uh, answer, just because it's a very big question. Don't have time to talk about this too much. But there's a, a practice called seven limb practice, and one of them is actually designed to counter the jealousy. It's um, the rejoice. Yeah, jealousy is a problem. Uh, they say that, you know, ma, you know some, some of the commentators say there's a two, actually, there are two uh, loser emotion. And among these two, this jealousy is even more of a loser. Um, anyway, pride being the other one. Um, jealousy, yes, is a real loser because um, at least, you know, passion, you get things done. <laughs> and with aggression also you get things done. And with ignorance you get storms. And it's kind of nice. But what you do with this jealousy is like baseless, totally. And most of the time it's like a story inside you. But actually if you want to topple, okay, one, one example. This I think comes from Miller um, If you want to tackle jealousy, you should have an economy embargo. No, Milarepa didn't say this. this I just, he, uh, I, I'm interpreting his words. Jealousy gets fed by pride. So, watch the pride, and then jealousy gets unsettled. I know how to do with the pride. We can talk later. It's too much, too long. Uh, thank you for coming to Vancouver. I, uh, I'm a big fan of your books. And I remember that you used the metaphor of onions, like a Buddhism teaching is like different layers of onion. And so I really enjoy readings and reading about Buddhism, but each onion I read, I kind of lose face of the previous onion, previous layers. And, but I also feel like I'm lacking practice. So it's like, oh, each layer, the more I read, um, but also lacking of practice. I, I don't know which onion should I pick and really sit with it and really do the work. I think, um, I think I will let you keep this problem. <laughs> Hi, Rinpoche. Thanks for your teaching. Um, I guess my question has been brought up, um, or similar questions have been brought up. Um, we've been talking about aspiration and usually it goes, may I, something, something. So it sounds to me like 
I am uh, in pursuit of something or trying mm. to do yes. something. Um, and you were also talking about the idea of selfless. So I guess my question is, if there's not a self, then who Yes, is yes, me and my monk. To... Yeah, you are exactly. talking exactly. about it. Yes, yes, I understand. And so also... Just remember, we are talking aspiration from the beginning of the dream till the end of the dream. Other than that, there is no aspiration. And I guess, sorry... And which, um, which will come this afternoon. They remember, Meba, they, it says, it ends with, you know, the Buddhist result. The aim of Buddhism should, is, is beyond aspiration. Is it sort of like um, someone else asked, asked the question um, if, like about discipline, and, um, but at, at the same time you said um, maybe we should let go of... Um, like I, I didn't hear that one. I, is it s similar to um, someone else asked the question earlier um, about discipline and then also how you said we should let go of um, like yes. firm grips on ideas? So is it sort of like um, until we see the, um, I guess you could call it the fundamental truth, mm -hmm. there needs to be a path and all these things are yes. a path. Is Everything from the beginning of the dream till the end, practice, discipline, generosity, prayers, everything exists there. And that's why you said to the German philosopher, like, in the end you have to give up being a Buddhist yes. anyway. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Rinpoche. I think one of your superpower is you're really good at making analogies. So I remember you mentioned nowadays mindfulness is a bit like diluted chai. Chai used to have this beautiful connotation, the smell of the train, the clay pot, the sugar, and the, the heart. So for someone or for people who aspire to make effective and memorable analogies, do you have any tips and tricks, mental model, app uh, recommendation, things like for that? For someone who aspire to make effective and memorable analogies. That's what the aspiration was doing, you know, like, may I be able to talk to people with different language to different people? I think, yeah, I think that's, that's why we do this. Yes. Basically, may What's I... What's your tips and tricks to deliberately <laughs> practice this ability? This is the trick, aspiring. Aspiring, I think. I think it really does. Best trick. Okay. Uh, what do you think is the most important thing about an intimate relationship from a Buddhist perspective? Buddhists don't really care so much about what you eat, what you drink, how you eat, how you drink, and also in the intimate relationship falls and in this kind of department, I think. If, <laughs> if you don't do it properly, you know, even, uh, I don't know, um, even a um, vegan chai might be uh, troublesome, you know, the vegan cappuccino drinkers, they are the worst sometimes. <laughs> They're like the, I don't know, like a vegetarian terrorist. There's a really good French film called Delicatissan. It's uh -huh. really good. Uh, um, my question is about the climate emergency and just the way that the world is going generally. Um, and years ago, I heard you say that we should make aspirations, that you know, if we're worried about the climate emergency, all that, that this would help a lot. Um, but I, I guess I still have some doubts because, um, I don't know. I've what is my thought about how the world work is going? Is that? N no, I mean, <laughs> from my point of view, maybe, maybe there really isn't any future. So what, what aspiration am I, I making in that case? 
No, no, you are, if you have taken the Bodhisattva vow, which if you, if you haven't and if you want to, we are doing it this afternoon. Okay, the world will end, this world will end, but so what? I'm not going to give this up. That's the attitude. But, frankly, no. Do you know, the, there's so many different things that's happening in the world. Some are really good. Just a few days ago, I downloaded the whole the collection of works of great Longchenpa in like two minutes. That is so good. Yeah, I know, but what do you mean? There's too many information, right? So we get stirred a bit. This is just me personally sharing you just what I do. You should listen to some of the most ridiculous, uh, what do you call it, blog? Podcast? Vlogs yes. and video, vlogs, ridiculous ones. <laughs> really helpful. <laughs> because then you should think they're all the same, you know, like they're all just... But uh, yes, actually, so I, but I, I appreciate, you know, that feels really like, really sort of very volatile, and which is in a way volatile. But um, Mahayana, especially Tantrikas, if it is volatile, this is a really good chance to reap the profit too. You spoke about having a bird's eye view and remembering the sadness of life. I'm wondering if this idea relates to teachings on uh, not abiding in extremes of samsara or nirvana or not preferring one or the other. Highest level. That is the real bird's eye's view of bird's eye's view. There's another bird then. <laughs> okay, we Thank take you. lunch break.